to um, introduce uh, Melissa Hopkins. Um, she did her college work at Pomona, um, her medical doctorate from the University of Maryland, and during that time spent some extra time at Shepherd Pratt, uh, which is the uh, famous uh, old Quaker hospital from the 1870s where I also spent three years in my psychiatric training. Um, Dr. Hopkins came to uh, UCSF for her uh, adult residency and is now finishing her child fellowship. She is um, energetic and uh, bright and alert and uh, managed to juggle more things uh, in this past year and a half than most of us, uh, including a seven-month-old child. Uh, she has particular interest in uh, integrated care and family uh, dynamics and development. And this presentation today is also uh, synonymously her uh, faculty recruitment job talk. Hello. So with that, uh, I want to welcome <laughs> Melissa Hopkins. We didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I Thank you all for joining me for Grand Rounds. Um, I will be talking to you all about integrated care, which is something that I have been very interested in uh, throughout my training here at UCSF when I've had the opportunity to rotate in several different integrated care settings, including one clinic currently where I'm with Dr. Kiati Bramba um, in the Pediatric Epilepsy Clinic. And she's joining me today as my discussant, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that clinic and one other one as well. I have no disclosures. And for learning objectives today, uh, they are to define integrated care and understand major integrated care models, to understand the need for and benefit of integrated care in pediatric populations, and to summarize the evidence supporting the application of integrated care in pediatric settings. So let's start off by reviewing some helpful definitions. There's a fair amount of inconsistency in the way the terminology is used within integrated care. So I'll attempt to clarify some of those terms as we go along today. If you have different understandings of the terminology, I'm happy to answer any questions and do my best to clarify. So integrated care broadly refers to the integration of behavioral health and physical health into one practice. And here, I'm using behavioral health to refer to both mental health and substance use treatment. Um, and I will use behavioral health and mental health interchangeably during this talk, but I just want to acknowledge they're not exactly the same thing. And um, here, medical care is referring, or physical care is referring to both primary care and subspecialty medical and surgical clinic uh, services. The location of services can vary, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, but these integrated clinics can be both mental health services integrated into the medical setting, as well as medical practices integrated into mental health settings. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the problem that we're hoping to address with integrated care. I'm sure I don't have to convince this audience that um, there are high rates of mental illness in youth, and this is compounded by poor access to care. About 10 to 20 percent of all youth have a diagnosable psychiatric condition, and 50 percent of mental health conditions have symptom onset before the age of 14, with three quarters of them having symptom onset before the age of 24. Yet only 20 to 30 percent of these patients access treatment, and there's an average of an 8 to 10 year delay in accessing services from symptom onset. In addition to that, youth with mental illness have poor outcomes. Among those um, include mental health problems having a very high burden of disease. So youth with mental illness are at risk for lifelong illness. And people with mental illness are also at risk for chronic illness as well as all-cause mortality. 
In addition to that, among the leading causes of death in youth are accidental death and suicide, which uh, both can be directly and indirectly affected by risky behaviors as well as mental illness. So, I again probably am preaching to the choir here, but we believe that early intervention can reduce lifetime morbidity and mortality, and, oops, sorry, and the evidence supports this. Yet, there is a significant treatment gap between the services needed and those that are available. This is in part due to the shortage of mental health providers, especially those trained in treating child and adolescents. Um, as an example of this, I've included the map over here. And that's the, from the most recent data from ACAP 2018. The red are the states that have a severe shortage of child adolescent psychiatrists, and the yellow have a high shortage, and the green would be where there's adequate providers, which there are no green states. Mm -hmm. There are also disparities in service allocation. <coughs> so, mental illness affects youth and has a significant disease burden. An early intervention can help improve outcomes, but there's a significant treatment gap between the services needed and those available. So, can integrated care address these issues? Integrated care takes a holistic approach to health and views uh, physical and mental health as being interwoven. It has been found to improve access to care. The majority of people with mental health conditions are treated in primary care settings, and integrated care improves access to care by meeting these patients where they are. Integrated care also supports primary medical providers in treating these conditions by providing them with education about treating mental health conditions, thus increasing their ability to independently treat psychiatric conditions. Integrated care has also been found to reduce health care costs, and it allows for the delivery of high quality and evidence-based treatments that lead to improved outcomes. Housing mental health, mental health care in medical settings has been found additionally to reduce stigma and discrimination, which are also barriers uh, to people accessing services. So let's next take a look at where these integrated care programs are and how they're built. Programs are most likely to succeed where there's a need for them and where there's infrastructure to support their development. Both primary care and subspecialty uh, medical settings have successfully integrated behavioral health uh, programs into these clinic settings. In primary care, most youth are seen annually for their well-child visits, of course, and this provides an opportunity to integrate behavioral health services. Many youth with mental health problems are already presenting to primary care. About half of pediatric office visits are related to behavioral, emotional, social, uh, developmental and educational concerns. <clears throat> and youth with health, uh, with behavioral health problems are more frequently utilizing pediatric services. 75% of youth with psychiatric disorders are already being treated for these conditions in primary care. So there clearly are patients who are needing to be treated in these settings. <clears throat> this is also the case of specialty medical clinics. So here, children with chronic illness are often very closely plugged into these clinic settings and they often have very long-standing relationships with their providers and so there is another opportunity to integrate behavioral health services. Psychiatric comorbidity in the chronically ill child has been studied extensively and it's been uh, reliably found that, that youth with chronic illness have elevated rates of mental health problems. Different chronic conditions are often associated with, with specific medical health uh, concerns, and providers that are plugged into these clinics can develop expertise in treating those constellation of disorders. This has most, been, uh, most commonly been studied in hematology, oncology, palliative care, and chronic pain clinics, but increasingly um, these uh, models of care are growing in other clinic settings such as neurology, pulmonology, cardiovascular, and, ga and gastroenterology clinics. And also historically there have been higher rates of non-MD mental health providers in these clinics and this is changing as well, bringing in more um, psychiatrists in addition to the non-MD mental health providers. 
So let's take a look at the evidence. Most of the evidence for integrated care has been uh, found in the adult setting, but this is changing, and there's a growing body of literature to support evidence in pediatric settings. A meta-analysis uh, by a group out of UCLA was published in JAMA Pediatrics in 2015, and they reviewed 30 randomized controlled trials that looked at integrated care in pediatric settings. They looked at any type of integrated care in primary care pediatrics for any age of pediatric uh, patient who was suffering from any type of mental health or substance use disorder. And they compared treatment as usual to integrated care interventions that were all evidence-based interventions, such as cognitive behavioral therapy and medication management. And they looked at the efficacy and then potential moderators for the efficacy. <coughs> Overall, they found that integrated care was more effective than treatment as usual, with a moderate effect size. Um, and they found that there was a 66% chance that a youth receiving integrated care versus treatment as usual would have improved outcomes. They found that these results uh, were, were effective for both children and adolescents, so any age, um, for any type of mental health condition. Um, however, the substance use group only had a weak effect. <coughs> And they found that this was effective for treatment, but not for prevention of mental health problems. The investigators hypothesized that actually this may underestimate the true efficacy of integrated care, because some of the studies, while they all use evidence-based um, at treatments, they, some of them had a weaker evidence base, and they thought that those might actually be not as effective as the ones that had stronger evidence, uh, thus diluting the overall effect sizes. There was also no long-term follow-up for these studies. Despite those limitations, this still supports the efficacy of integrated care. And in fact, there's been a national and global consensus about the efficacy of integrated care models, and that has supported the development of these programs across the country um, in different ways. So let's talk about those ways. So I'm going to go through some of the models of integrated care. Um, there are many, and I'm not going to cover all of them today, but I will give you a framework to think about them. So SAMHSA and the HRSA <laughs> developed a center for, um, for integrated health solutions, and they proposed a standard framework for integrating services in 2013. So this is a six-tiered uh, system that stratifies models based on their level of collaboration between providers and the amount of integration of services and practice organization. They view integrated care as being on a continuum uh, from minimal coordination to uh, full integration. So looking at our um, diagram here on this side, so we have the more minimal going all the way up to full integration. Um, on the more minimal side, we have um, what they're referring to as coordinated care, where the key element is communication between providers. In the middle, we have co-located, where um, there is physical proximity between providers. And then on the far right are the more integrated models, um, where there's actual practice change, and at the most integrated being like full merging of practice. First, let's take a look at the consultation model. So this on our diagram is on the left side, so on the more minimal side of, uh, of integration. Here we have providers in separate locations, and a primary provider will refer a patient for evaluation, and this can be done in various ways depending on the system, so um, in person potentially, or using various technologies to have the patient assessed, including electronic consult, phone consultation, as well as telemental health. This is usually a one-pass evaluation where the mental health provider will give recommendations for treatment back to the referring provider who can then implement those recommendations as they see fit. The major advantage to the system is that it provides access to care in places where there is none, so in remote areas where there are very few or no mental health services. The major drawback is that there's really minimal built-in mechanism for follow-up of these patients, so it's hard to know if your recommendations were helpful, uh, if the patients improved, if they need to change the treatment plan. There's no real way to do that in most cases. <coughs> and this best serves patients um, are who are in remote areas, like I said, where there are no services, um, or if there's some, some sort of concise issue that a provider can assess and make a recommendation for. So one of the most notable examples of this model are the Child um, Psychiatry Access Programs, or CPAPs. 
And these are modeled after the Massachusetts Child Psychiatry Access Project, which started in 2004. These programs are designed to provide a range of scaffolding resources for primary pediatricians to treat mental health conditions in the primary care setting. And they're designed to address both the resource gap as well as the knowledge gap. The common services that are provided include informal curbsides of patients, uh, direct clinical assessment, assistance with referrals and navigation of community resources, and then educational programming for primary care providers about treating mental health conditions. Based on data that's been gathered on these programs over the years, they found that the most common consult questions are about medication management and about referrals and community resources. Over half of the states currently have a CPAP program in place, and this is growing. Lots of states are developing these programs currently. And in Massachusetts, there is over a 95% enrollment of pediatricians in the state, which is amazing. Um, and 65% of pediatricians are accessing these services annually, so they're being used. And by, they are satisfied with the services available. Survey data has found that these programs um, improve uh, pediatrician comfort with behavioral health issues, and they improve their perceived ability to address the behavioral health concerns of their patients. The largest criticism for this model is that um, it does not expedite patients getting in to see subspecialty mental health care, which again is one of the major reasons why these uh, services are being accessed. Um, so that does support the further integration of services to increase access to care. So let's move on to talking about the co-located model. So this here is in the middle of our continuum. <coughs> And so here, the care is provided on site with mental health providers sharing the same facility as the medical team. And this may or may not be in the same physical office space, practice space. If it is in the same clinic, it's referred to as embedded care. And here, the primary provider is gonna refer their patient to be assessed uh, by the mental health provider and oftentimes stabilized and potentially even managed. It depends on the model. The major advantages of this model are that it improves timely access to assessment, and the face-to-face -face, face -face aspect of the care allows for better communication and coordination between providers, um, more easy, it's easier to have curbsides and then also to implement educational programming. <coughs> the biggest downside um, is that whether it is intended or not, oftentimes this model ends up with the mental health provider taking on a panel of patients over time and they can often get full, completely filled up and then they're not really an available resource anymore to the team. Patients who are um, best served in this model are those who are lower acuity and motivated for treatment by having issues accessing care for whatever reason and they need timely assessment and perhaps stabilization, but then they would be appropriate to be transferred back to the primary provider for ongoing management. This model is also great for patients who are higher acuity but not motivated for treatment where mental health services can be introduced in a gradual way to help engage them where they are. I'm not going to talk about a specific example of this model, but Kiati is going to uh, share a couple of those uh, during her portion of the presentation. <coughs> so next, let's talk about collaborative care, um, which was a model of integrated care that was developed at the University of Washington. And this is toward the right side, um, so more fully integrated. In fact, it was uh, initially um, and often designed to fully merge these practices. Um, whether that happens or not depends on where you are and how it's being done. Uh, but the idea is to make one health home for patients where they can receive all of their care. This model uses a team-based approach uh, consisting of a primary care provider, a care manager, and then a psychiatric consultant. And so here, the medical provider and the care manager are the ones who are primarily involved in care coordination and patient care. The primary care provider is also going to prescribe medications. Um, and then the care, the care manager is going to assess patients using objective measures. They will use time-limited evidence-based interventions, and they track outcomes as well. And then the psychiatrist will review the caseload with the care manager. 
um, and they will ensure that there's timely improvement of patients. And if that does not happen, they will consult on cases to ch actively change the treatment plan. This is called stepped care, and I'll mention that um, some more in a little bit. They also are able to consult on diagnostically difficult cases or really any case that the team needs their eyes on. <coughs> And they're available for curbsides as well as for educational programming, just like the other models of care. Here are the core principles of collaborative care. I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but just to mention a few key points. Um, so this model uses a registry to track, track patients and outcomes. They define a clear treatment plan that has both patient goals as well as clinical outcomes that will be tracked with objective measures. And they use stepped care to actively change treatment plans if patients are not improving until their goals are achieved. And then they use relapse prevention. They also only use evidence-based treatments. The major benefits of this system are that with the improved care coordination, this leads to increased engagement of patients. Stepped care leads to stratification of patients based on the severity um, and their treatment response and leads to more effective use of resources. And there is the strongest evidence for this model. The biggest downside is that there are financial and structural barriers oftentimes setting up these models. So oftentimes you're having to completely remodel a care system. The patients who are best served in this model are those who are having difficulty accessing services, um, those who are less engaged, um, and then when there's significant uh, physical and mental health comorbidity where you really need close coordination between providers to um, provide adequate care. <clears throat> Taking a look at the literature, um, so there is a pretty large body of literature looking at collaborative care. I'm first going to talk about the adult setting because that's where the majority of the literature is. Uh, but there has been an uh, efficacy proven in both the adult and pediatric settings for a variety of psychiatric conditions, including depression, anxiety, and PTSD, among others. Uh, Cochrane 2012 review looked at um, 80 uh, different randomized control trials that examine the efficacy of collaborative care as compared to treatment as usual in treating depression and anxiety, and they found improved outcomes as compared to treatment as usual. I can't talk about collaborative care and not mention the IMPACT study. Uh, many of you may be aware of the study already, so this was a landmark trial um, done out of uh, University of Washington and published in JAMA in, 20, er, in 2002. And this was a study that first showed the efficacy of treating adults with depression in collaborative care settings. And they found a 50% reduction of depressive symptoms at one year, and these results persisted over time and have been associated with improved health outcomes, including uh, rates of serious cardiovascular events. In the pediatric population, uh, there's also growing evidence, and I'd like to talk to you about one uh, wonderful study that was also done out of University of Washington, and it was a randomized controlled trial that was published in JAMA in 2014, and they looked at collaborative care as a model to treat adolescents with depression. So they had randomized 100 patients to collaborative care or treatment as usual for 12 months. And they found that there were reductions in symptoms in the collaborative care group, um, both for treatment response and for rates of remission. You can see that on their graph over here. This is the usual care group on the top and then the, implement, the, the intervention on the bottom. So putting all this together, there isn't one best model for integrated care. Each model has unique strengths, and systems should utilize a combination of models to best serve the differing needs of their patients. It's important to have common core principles in developing these models to ensure that they are able to fulfill their purpose. ACAP developed a framework that outlines principles for developing mental health care um, and sustaining these practices in the pediatric health home. These principles are designed to support family-focused care, professional collaboration and care coordination between teams, as well as care plan development. They describe care components of integrated care that should be held consistent in different settings, and they include the screening for and uh, early detection of behavioral health problems, 
triage and referral to appropriate behavioral health treatments, timely access to child adolescent psychiatric assessment, and that's both for informal curbside as well as direct assessment, access to child psychiatric subspecialty treatment for those with moderate to severe illness, care coordination that facilitates the delivery of services and ensures that collaboration is occurring between team members, and uh, monitoring outcomes as well. And then it's not mentioned in the ACAP guidelines, but across the literature you'll see again and again the importance of having uh, educational programming to support the development of non-mental health providers in deploying mental health treatment. So systems need a guide to help them develop appropriate treatments uh, for different groups of patients uh, that they treat. The National Council for Community Behavioral Health Care developed a four-quadrant model um, that was intended to serve as a framework for developing uh, and designing integrated care programs and adequately meeting needs of populations. So they recognize that different groups of patients have unique needs and a system needs to be able to nimbly triage patients and deliver appropriate services to that population. <laughs> This was not designed as, um, as to be a, a determinant where an individual receives treatment and they emphasize the importance of meeting patients wherever they are seeking services. But again, this is more of a framework to develop a system of care. And so they define populations based on their physical and mental health risk and complexity. And so on the X axis, we have physical health risk and complexity from low to high. And then on the Y axis, we have behavioral health risk, and here they say comorbidity, but it's usually uh, complexity from low to high. And then the different quadrants. Um, and so just broadly um, going into this a little bit, without getting lost in the weeds. So the quadrants um, one and three are patients who have low to moderate physical health risk and complexity. And they say that these patients should be seen primarily in medical settings, so either in primary care or in subspecialty medical settings depending on their physical health needs. And they should be supported um, with consultation and different integrated programs, whatever system can provide, um, to help address the behavioral health concerns of these patients in those clinic settings. And then for our quadrants uh, two and four, these are patients who have moderate to high uh, behavioral health risk and complexity. And they should be seen uh, both in subspecialty mental health settings as well as in either primary care or uh, subspecialty medical settings with more fully integrated behavioral health services. Um, especially for quadrant four where you have patients with very moderate to high uh, risk and complexity for both physical and for um, mental health. They will need the fullest integration of services to adequately address the comorbidities. So in conclusion, uh, mental illness afflicts youth and has a significant disease burden. Early intervention can help improve outcomes, but there's a significant treatment gap between the services needed and those that are available. Integrated care systems take a holistic approach to health. They address barriers to accessing care and they can effectively treat youth with mental health concerns. There are many different models of integrated care and these vary in the amount of collaboration between providers and the amount of integration of services. Integrated care recognizes that patients have differing needs based on their psychiatric condition, severity and complexity and effective treatment should be patient-centered. And frameworks should guide systems in combining different integrated care programs and especially mental health treatment to deliver services to patients who have different needs, thus optimizing patient care and reducing and, and resource allocation. I have some resources here, but in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through these. I'm happy to send these out to people would like and my references. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melissa. That was really comprehensive um, and really helpful. Um, before I start, I'll just say I have no disclosures other than I work for UCSF. Uh, okay. So the reason I say that was really great, I love sort of have you 
described all the different ways in which people think about integrated care. And the, the one picture for me that really captures it is, is this sort of tree with all these different um, limbs and end in different places um, that really captures how complex this whole area is. So if you um, look at the bottom, it starts with sort of what we have usually, which is siloed mental health care, substance abuse care, and primary care. And then, you know, we start integrating mental health care and substance abuse into behavioral health care. And then there's some um, kind of efforts towards patient-centered medical homes where you're bringing in some, of, some elements of behavioral health into the primary care setting. And then, then, you know, the idea came, let's just truly integrate everything rather than borrow p pieces of this. Uh, but then that's led to lots of different ways in integrating care. Um, and really, I think of remembering three things, who is being integrated, what is being integrated, and where is it being integrated. And that sort of helps you figure out what kind of um, care or integrated care or level of integrated care you're um, providing. Um, so ideal is truly integrated care where not just you see the patients in the same location, you chart in the same system, you bill through the same mechanisms, so it, it's all really truly one clinic. Um, and that is really a huge effort at a really big systems level. Um, so I'm not going to go into the details of sort of all the systems, but what I'm hoping to do is just talk about a few examples of what this would look like in real life, sort of, you know, what we've heard so far about the different models of integrated care. Um, so as um, Melissa already discussed, there are these building blocks that ACAP had suggested for any integrated care model, and I will go through the use of these um, and talk a little bit about the use of screening and how that starts becoming really um, a big question mark as you start practically implementing these programs. So again, these are the four quadrants with a little bit more detail of what goes into each quadrant. Uh, the beauty, I feel, of the quadrant model is you can use it to organize an entire system of care or an individual clinic. Um, and it's really sort of you can zoom in and out with the same model, um, which is really helpful. So an example of a systems organization with the four quadrant model, for example, would be in quadrant one, would be sort of what Melissa had said, they're usually in their primary care settings, um, or maybe adolescent medicine for some of the transitional age youth. Um, in quadrant three, which there's still low behavioral health, here you see really more subspecialty care uh, patients. So these are kids who have slightly higher medical illness or physical illness complexity um, and still relatively low behavioral health complexity. Um, and here, you know, embedding care or co-locating care or doing some form of collaborative care in subspecialty pediatrics is what we are trying to do here at UCSF, which is the POP clinic. Um, and I will talk a little bit about that. It's just pediatric outpatient psychiatry clinic that started last week. Um, so I will talk a little bit about what that clinic is all about and how we're trying to sort of address that quadrant three within UCSF. Um, and quadrant two, which is high behavioral health but low physical health, this is really where we see more coordinated consultative models of care where still the majority of the care for behavioral health is happening at LPPI. They're still seeing their primary care providers, but there is sort of you know ways to collaborate and coordinate that care. And then quadrant four, which is high behavioral health and high physical health, uh, an example of this, in, so these patients still usually are in subspecialty pediatrics, and an example of a clinic in this setting is the collaborative um, care collaborative for pediatric epilepsy clinic that um, we have been working on over the last three or four years. It's been an ongoing clinic. Um, in some cases, the POP clinic could move up into that quadrant four, but usually it's more located in quadrant three. So, <coughs> so the COPE clinic, which is the care collaboration in pediatric epilepsy, we have also used the four quadrant model to organize this clinic itself. Um, and so what we do is we screen people for mental health and we screen people for various measures related to their epilepsy. Um, and that includes health related quality of life, their epilepsy severity, um, their physical impairment, um, their social um, difficulties and challenges. And we put all of that together to decide which quadrant the patient belongs in. 
Um, so patients who have you know, sort of lower needs, we do a lot of prevention work, so they get handouts about education material about what to look for, when, what does depression look like, for example, in a kid with epilepsy, what does anxiety look like, what are some community resources for you know, sort of mindfulness and, and things that are preventative. Um, and then in quadrant three, they, they see a psychiatrist if needed. They usually uh, are primarily seen by the neurological specialists, so nurse practitioners and neurologists, and we do a monthly meeting where I do a lot of education for how to manage these sort of low-level um, primary depression or maybe ADHD, uh, mild anxiety. And then in quadrant two, um, this is where the, the referral goes to mental health providers, and same in quadrant four, except the difference being in quadrant four, they always go to the child psychiatrist, which is I'm the child psychiatrist in the clinic, um, and then in quadrant two, they go to the uh, nurse practitioner, um, and so we have sort of tried to delineate between how to best utilize all our um, expertise and extend each other rather than sort of have duplicative care and in a way step it up or step it down. The goal is always to keep people moving through these quadrants, right? So it's this is not a static quadrant. Um, the idea is if a patient is in quadrant four, we are constantly making the effort to move them down to quadrant three or one. Um, or sometimes to two. So it, it, the idea is to always try and downgrade the quadrant to the degree possible and ideally move everyone into quadrant one. Um, and um, you know, when you, when you do these clinics, it's really important to look at outcomes. And some of the outcomes that we are looking at are, so there are three ways when you, when you think about, so this is really health services research or implementation science research. So when you're looking at outcomes in this area, unless you've designed a sort of randomized control trial or you know, a, a, a study like that, the most common models used are uh, implementation science data points, and those include process measures, outcomes measures, and balance measures. So the process measures is basically, is what you had set out to do actually what is happening in the clinic? Um, so you know, if you said you were just going to screen everyone using the pediatric symptom checklist for mental health, what percentage of those patients are actually getting screened using the pediatric symptom checklist? Um, then if you create a triad system, like people who have a cutoff score of X get to see a nurse practitioner, people with a cutoff score of Y get to see a child psychiatrist, you look at the numbers and see what actually happened. So you're basically constantly checking to see that the plan you had is actually what's occurring in real life. And I think, I hope you all know that things really can wildly fluctuate from the time you think about it to the time it actually happens in real life in a clinic. Um, but it gives you an opportunity to sort of look where things broke down and re-intervene because this is really a sort of PDSA cycle of continuing to improve and move to your goal. Um, outcome measures are really sort of eventually what you're interested in is all of this actually helping the patients. So when you're screening, what is the outcome? What percentage of patients are depressed? What percentage of patients have an anxiety disorder? What are the different mix? How long is it taking for them to access care? These are just some examples. Because you know, a lot of the times embedded care, we are hoping that we will improve access to care. So you want to measure if it's actually improving access to care. Um, and then balance measures are sort of unintended consequences. Um, so you know, you thought you were gonna screen everybody and that was gonna be great, but now maybe the unintended consequences, there's all these people who we know have depression, but we have no way of treating them, and now we've created this backlog of patients who know they're depressed, but are not gonna get care. Um, and you know, looking at community referrals, so we can make the best laid plans of we're gonna screen people and then refer them to community providers, and then a year later you can look at the data and see like, well, that really hasn't happened, and we are carrying all these patients. Um, and so this helps you figure out, did you have unintended consequences? Or sometimes the community is now getting flooded with these referrals, and they might not really be prepared to handle this volume of um, referrals. So those are different things, and these are the different outcomes that you want to measure when you set up these clinics. So for example, in our COPE clinic, this is the entire battery of um, screening tools that we use. I won't go through the details of them, but most of the top ones are looking at the medical complexity. And it really is a, is a more gnarly question to answer, uh, sort of where does somebody lie on a spectrum of high to low uh, physical health complexity? Because it's not, you know, for example, in epilepsy, how do you decide if somebody has 
severe or most low rates of epilepsy. I mean, there are all these different kinds of epilepsies, and some people have, you know, 50 absence seizures a day, but they are still functioning versus people who have like three generalized tonic-clonic seizures a day, and how much that impacts them. Um, plus, there are all these other variables to think about, like medication side effects, and are they physically, um, you know, have limitations or not. Um, that's why usually the, the screening tools that we use for the physical complexity tends to be a lot more complicated and usually multiple things that, that decide the complexity. And then for the mental health com complexity, there are lots of different scales you can use. Um, we went with the pediatric symptom checklist because it's free and our parents refuse to do the CBCL in the BASC, uh, so, which are much longer tools. Um, and, and which is very interesting, parents who don't come to psychiatry don't want to fill out long mental health questionnaires, which is, you know, not something we had um, anticipated at first. They don't want to do them here either. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's uh, slightly reassuring. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so then I'll very briefly talk about the POP clinic because I really want to make this more sort of talking back and forth and hear about your thoughts. So this is a clinic that went live last week. Um, and again, our goal was, so you know, we've, we have this model in the epilepsy clinic and there are other subspecialists. So GI, for example, is often one that has high rates of comorbidities with a lot of psychosomatic complaints in patients. Um, there's, um, you know, Hemonk, like you mentioned. We have the gender clinic. There are all these other clinics that were looking for similar um, setups and embedded care within their settings. But our system is sort of challenged in truly integrating care because we are not on sort of the same funds flow and I won't go into what that really is, but it, it just means that it's harder at the back end um, to make um, faculty in one division or department be working in another division or department and, and have the financial aspect of it actually work out. And so that really limits our ability to expand this. And it also means that you know people would be embedded in a lot of these different clinics and requires a lot of manpower, which means hiring a lot of people. And so we thought about, well, how about we, instead of doing a collaborative or embedded care, do sort of a co-located model, uh, which is start a consult clinic within the same building where all these subspecialty clinics are. Um, and that's really what the POP clinic is. Um, and the idea is that we would assess these patients and do short-term follow-up, um, while the care manager in that diagram, if you remember, that Melissa had presented, which is usually the social worker in all these subspecialty clinics, they all have social workers. Each patient is assigned a social worker who helps us in the process help access community resources and care. Um, and they're doing that anyways. What this does is it starts the patients getting some care while they're waiting to access community resources. Um, and we are focused right now mostly on medication management because a lot of these clinics already have either um, medical, social, clinical social workers or MFTs or other therapists who are providing a lot of the therapy and we don't have a full-time um, you know, um, therapist on our team, but that, that is the eventual goal is to really provide the entire array of services, not just medication management. Um, and currently we have a you know, child psychiatrist and um, nurse practitioner and our, my hope is in the future to have psychology or licensed clinical social work or therapy. Um, and then our plan is to screen and triage everybody and that's sort of, um, the, the research plan is to sort of do sick care as usual for six months to so see how the natural triaging goes and then actually impose a screening based triaging system on it and then have it go for six months and then compare the outcomes of where do people land if you do triaging as usual and where do people land when you sort of impose this four quadrant triaging onto it um, and see if it actually makes a difference or not. Um, and you know, kind of look at outcomes in addition to that, kind of the, you know, how many people are depressed, how many people are anxious, what are the wait times, all of those other measures that I have talked about. So those are, this is just me talking about what Melissa had said, what systems can do, and how we are trying to apply that here within our system at UCSF, more in subspecialty care uh, based on Mission Bay. So with that, I will stop and thank you. Maybe Melissa can come up. Question? Um, 
you, you didn't spend time talking about resistance to embedded clinics or to integrated care, and yet I know you both thought about that and experienced it and dealt with it. I wonder um, if you have any words of wisdom about strategies you've used to, to have uh, the resistance in the system that might range from billing or control or a number of other things. What, what helps, even though it's a good idea, what, what encounters do you have that are struggles and that you've worked your way through? Well, as a trainee, I'm protected from that somewhat, um, although I have spoken uh, with Kiati a fair amount about that, so I'll definitely let her put in her two cents. I think one of the biggest things that I've been thinking about when it comes to resistance is about moving from more of that like embedded or co-located model to being more fully integrated, where you're really working together and collaborating and sharing responsibility um, and tracking outcomes, so kind of the more service and practice integration um, being something that's hard to get folks to think about. Um, and one of the reasons why I think that's hard is because if you put a mental health provider into a clinic setting, it kind of in initially alleviates the pressure that the medical providers are feeling. And so for a while, it's well, the problem solved. And then I think over time, as um, the mental health provider fills up, it becomes more and more of a problem. Um, I, I haven't had experience working with people and trying to change that, although um, from some of the trainings that I've done with the APA, they talk about trying to go to a systems level and addressing it from like a financial perspective and really looking at the data that this improves outcomes and it, it reduces costs of healthcare um, over time. And so there's reason for that. They have to have buy-in from the system to really implement those changes from the top down level as opposed to the bottom up. So that's what I'll say. I'll let Kiati add her. Usually, uh, systems don't change until the people in charge retire and new people <laughs> <laughs> take it because inertia yeah. will triumph in the end. That's, those are very wise words. Um, I don't know that I have, you know, a solution. I can tell you that, you know, what you said is so um, true because this epilepsy clinic that I'm talking about, I talked about it with our um, neurology colleague when I interviewed for this position back in 2014 um, and we we're just starting to sort of like really truly do this in the last year um, and so it takes a long time I think what has helped is a lot of different things one of it is really getting to know the people individually there have been times where sort of the freemium model where you kind of go see a few patients and show them what that would be like um, if they really had more of your time um, and then get the conversation going. Um, it has been a lot of waiting for the right people and the right systems to fall in place and sort of nudge things along. So for example, you know, having our um, Eva Marie Turner kind of come into that position and she has some experience with this in the adult world uh, was really key in at least our pop clinic uh, and making it happen and, and really having you know, leadership that wanted buy-in. I know Brian King was really supportive of this idea when it was first presented to him and he continues to do so. So really kind of, I think it takes a lot of different players and um, I guess the key ingredient is patience. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you talked about measurement and sort of <coughs> assessing the kind of patients you're dealing with and their families. Um, I, and I, you opted for the PSQ, PSC, which I understand why, but there's no, I, no indication of how you assess developmental levels, and uh, which seems to me fairly critical in pediatrics, and pediatrics, pediatricians often are not aware of the developmental levels of their patients, and that affects interventions. The other one that, that I didn't get a sense of was family function, structure, stress, what have you, and since that would also play a role, and how do you uh, how do you account for those things? Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so that that's a great question. Um, as far as uh, developmental levels of kids go, there isn't a scale that we use. It, it often is a clinical assessment that we do when we see the patients. In in the epilepsy clinic, it's a little. Um, 
easier because a lot of them have had pretty significant neuropsychological testing. The patients that we end up seeing are usually sort of pre-post-surgical patients. So because they're going to undergo neurosurgery, um, they've had pretty extensive neuropsychological testing or neurocognitive testing. So that's pretty very useful in that setting. But in our um, um, pop clinic setting, our goal is to really first start off um, with more clinical assessments. But if you have any sort of advice or suggestions for tools or scales that might be useful, I, I would love to hear more about that. Um, and then as far as the patient um, uh, parent, uh, let me, okay. So uh, stressful life events survey, maternal mood, uh, these are just some of the scales where we are trying to start looking at parent factors and social um, psychological factors um, to make sure that we're not sort of siloed into just looking at things in very um, separate ways when everything kind of interacts with each other. So that's the first effort. Um, and then, you know, the NeuroQual and the QualC, they also have measures within there, the different elements that eventually sort of show up in quality of life. Um, so that's sort of what we're doing within the COPE clinic. Um, in the POP clinic, like I said, we are sort of in this six month of care as usual phase before we start implementing any sort of screening. So um, that's something that I think we're going to carry over. We'll just have to look at more broad sort of health related quality of life scales. These are much more specific to epilepsy. I guess if, um, I don't know if anybody watching remotely, is there a way to ask questions or no? Um. Nobody there. Can I ask a question? Sure. I'd be interested to hear, you guys were talking about like kind of moving oh, people through the quadrants um, and that kind of ultimately trying to huh? stabilize and move down <coughs> the intensity of the level of care. I'd be interested in hearing more about that in terms of if you feel like that's on that, that smoothly at all overall or if there are barriers to doing that or strategies for helping facilitate that movement. Well, I'll say, I mean, I think we're a little bit early in the process because this is a relatively new model. Um, but, and I would also just say that the more fully integrated systems are, the more easy that will be to do. Um, as you can imagine, there'll be barriers to every step if you're transitioning between you know, Mission Bay and Langley Porter. And um, so I, I think it will have, we'll have to see what happens. I don't know if you have any. Um, so it's, it's never like a smooth, you know, go from three, four to three, two, one. Um, there's a lot of sort of, I think of it as a dance, you take a few steps forward and a few steps back. Um, we've certainly had, I, I can give you case examples, we haven't like looked at that data and dissected it out for me to talk about it from a big picture data perspective, but we've certainly had cases, and I know Caitlin's here, where we've sort of said, hey, is this patient, you know, can you just see them here in LPPI, because they're gonna need really significant amounts of mental health care, and their epilepsy is pretty stable, like they don't really need to be seen within the epilepsy clinic. And then other times, you know, where those patients have sort of either through the emergency room in other ways ended up where I've seen them, and then we collaborate on, you know, what's the next best step. So sort of clinically we do it on a case-by-case -case basis, and it feels like it's worked out pretty well so far, but we, I haven't yet kind of pulled that data to look at how many patients are going from one to the other quadrant at what percentages. Yeah, and I think just the maintaining the relationships between collaborators there is really important, but there's always going to be misfires. Um, however, your kind of triage system works where people end up in the wrong quadrant or end up in the wrong place and they really should have been somewhere else, but they aren't so easy to move. Um, so you, I mean, you really need to um, have close relationships with the people who are doing other parts of it, which I think we do pretty well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, for our system itself, the biggest um, determining factor is because I can see anybody in the epilepsy clinic, if they have Medi-Cal, then I see them. Uh, so it, that, I mean, and that really doesn't belong anywhere in the quadrant, uh, you know, people's insurance level. Um, but that becomes the practical consideration. And, you know, I know we are all hoping that will be different in the future, but yeah. I have a question. Um, when just working on a one-on-one -on -one, um, situation with the um, medical doctors, medical practitioners, um, sometimes do you, do you ever feel like there's a power struggle regarding the patient's care when they don't really see the care one, like eye to eye with this? Yeah, I mean, you're highlighting the importance of relationships when you're working 
in teams and inter especially in interdisciplinary teams. And so I think you have to leverage the, the relationship and the circumstances where you may not see eye to eye and figure out how to kind of meet in the middle and collaborate knowing that it's going to be a fluid process with uh, treatment plan changes as you go along. Um, that's, that's my two cents on that, I know. Yeah, the only thing I will say is there may be a power differential and we can do a lot about not making it a struggle. <laughs> well, unfortunately, our time is now for me.